Hey folks, okay, well, in the last couple of sessions we went from a set of regular expressions for the tokens in our language to a minimized deterministic finite automata to recognize those tokens. So this time, what we want to do is go from there to the actual code for our scanner. And again, we want to generate this automatically. So we'll look at several different approaches for doing this. All right, um, the three common approaches that we'll rely on here are either table-driven, where we use a bunch of different lookup tables to go through and say, okay, well, you know, what should my next state be? What kind of character am I looking at? So we'll use a table-driven approach in one, and for that one, we'll have kind of language-independent code, but language-dependent tables. In direct-coded, we'll go through and say, okay, well, instead of using tables, let's actually hard code that information into our source code. So our source code will be very much, very language specific. And then the other approach is, of course, our, our not auto-generated approach, where we'll actually do it by hand, where we'll sit down and say, okay, I, I think I can come up with better, faster, op better, better, faster, more optimized logic to do this that I'm going to get out of the automated approaches. So for each of the approaches, essentially what's happening is we're producing code that simulates the DFA, right, starting from a, the start state, reading through the, the characters, and trying to identify when we've hit the end of a valid token, when we should stop, carrying out our transitions, figuring out what the correct token type is. So the key differences are all in how it actually carries out that simulation. And the impact is mostly in terms of how easy it is to generate and how efficient the code winds up being in terms of execution speed and memory use. So again, for each of them, we're going through reading input characters and carrying out transitions from one state to another in our finite state machine. And we keep going as long as we can keep reading more characters Right? Because we don't know, at any given point, we don't know if, you know, maybe if I read a few more characters, I'm going to wind up in a valid state. So you keep reading as far as you possibly can. And when you hit the point where there are no more transitions from your current state on whatever the next input character is, where you can't go anywhere further, then you stop and look at the state that you're in. And if the state that you're in is an accept state, then you can say, ah, great, you know, I found a whatever kind of token this is. Whatever the, the Which accept state you're in tells you which kind of token it is. If you're not in an accept state, then you say, ah, okay, maybe a couple of characters back, I was in an accept state, and that was the token I should have accepted. And so you roll back to that more most recent accept state and say, okay, that's that's the token that we'll accept. And then we'll start processing from there looking for a new token. And if you roll all the way back and you haven't seen, you haven't passed through an accept state at all, then you give up and say, okay, look, I read all these characters and I couldn't figure out any way to recognize any sequence of them as a token. I give up. So all three approaches follow that basic logic. Again, it's just how they get there that's different. So the three of them, we'll look at table-driven, direct-coded, and hand-coded. The table-driven uses one generic set of source code. So the algorithm is fixed. The algorithm isn't dependent on the language that you're trying to, to tokenize. And you'll have a set of tables that identify you know, if I look at my next character, what kind of a character is it in terms of the language that we're processing? You know, are, are uppercase characters relevant? Are digits relevant? So it'll have a classifier that breaks your th that next character down into one of a different one of a set of possible character types. So we'll look that up in one table, and then we'll have a transition table that says, okay, for whatever state I'm in, and for whatever kind of character I'm in or looking at. What should I do next? What should my next state be? So again, our algorithm is just going through and saying, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll have one variable for my current state, one variable for the, the next character, and I'm just going to keep going until, well, maybe a, a stack as well, but we'll talk about that in a bit. But we'll have, uh, 
we'll just have this fixed set of, of data types, this fixed set of information that we're keeping track of, and we'll use the tables to tell us what we should do next, right? which, which way our code should branch or jump next. And then once we finally hit an accept state, or once we've reached the point where we know we can't accept, then uh, we'll have a table that says, okay, for my whichever accept state you're in, or for whichever state you're in, what kind of token does that represent? So the scanner generator, the tool that we've got, the, the Lex equivalent, if you like, that is going to produce our scanner is going to go through that DFA and it's going to produce these tables for us, right? So we've got this fixed program that's going to do the, the run of the scanning, but we've got to generate the three tables for it. So our scanner generator, the thing that writes the scanner for us, is going to look at our DFA and produce the three tables that our scanner is going to use. So again, we've got a fixed algorithm, language independent, and these three specialized tables. The second approach that we'll look at, the direct coded approach says, okay, having those tables might not be the most efficient way to go. The tables might be huge, right? They might take up a ton of space in memory, which could wind up causing all sorts of problems with cache and paging and whatnot. Um, all sorts of issues with you know, just the, the sheer volume of, of space that we're taking up in memory. So maybe instead of lookup tables, what we'll do is for each of them, we'll have a chunk of hard-coded code. So we'll have case statements or if-else statements that basically say, okay, you know, if, the, uh, if the character is one of these cases, then you know, jump to this state. If the character is one of these uh, cases, jump to this state. So you'll actually have it hard-coded rather than having these tables. So, you eliminate the need for having these tables stored in memory, but your source code gets bigger, and your source code is now language-specific. So, you can't reuse that source code for a different language just by swapping in new tables. So, this does have some advantages. Again, it, it decreases the amount of time and memory you need for the table lookups, but it increases the code size and the code complexity and makes our scanner language-specific. So which one of those two approaches, and again, our, uh, our scanner generator is going to have to produce the source code for us, right? It's going to have to produce this um, hard-coded source code for that, lang for that specific language. But again, that's not any more difficult than generating the tables. It's just different. So which one of the two approaches, table or direct, um, is more effective depends on what your needs are. Right, what uh, what the specific language is, how big those tables are going to be, how big the code's going to be, which is more important to you, uh, you know, low memory use or uh, uh, smaller executables, that kind of thing. And then, of course, the other possibility is we can say, nah, I don't want to use a, a scanner generator at all. I'm going to write my own version of this. And you can rely on sort of developer knowledge of the language and of the, these two techniques to come up with a kind of hybrid of the two with some other tweaks and improvements to try and produce something that's even better. But of course, you've got, if, it's, if you're doing this by hand, then you can't rely on it being as mistake-free, right? You've got more debugging issues, um, more reliability issues, and it's going to take you more time. You know, if, if you've got something that you just run a tool and in 10 seconds it produces what you want, that's uh, obviously a little easier on the development budget than having a bunch of developers paid to go through and write this thing by hand. So all sorts of different possibilities. We'll look at each of them in some detail over the next few sessions. So next time around, we'll uh, start off with the table-driven approach.